Thank you very much. Okay, well, first of all, we should uh, welcome Majid Nawaz, who's made it here at last, mm -hmm. caught in traffic, but we're, we're leaving you till, till the end to catch your breath. <laughs> Okay, so, so uh, next I'd like to invite our Miriam Namazi, but let me first um, tell you a little bit about Miriam's life and work. She's a political activist, a campaigner, uh, and a blogger. Um, she's a spokesperson for FITNA, a, a women's liberation movement. Um, uh, she is closely involved with the Council of Ex-Muslims in, in Britain, uh, as well as Iran Solidarity, which she founded. Um, and the International Committee Against Stoning, and many other uh, organizations, too, too many to mention. She's an honorary uh, uh, um, associate of the National Secular Society, was a devoted secularist of the year by them back in 2005. She's won numerous uh, awards from around the world for over a period of nearly three decades for her humanitarian work and her journalism. Uh, she's worked recently, uh, in recent years tirelessly uh, in support of Iranian refugees. Uh, she was also, uh, for a time, the British Human Association's Head of Ceremonies. Uh, politically, she is uh, a member of the Central Committee of the Workers' Communist Party of Iran. Marin, welcome. And I believe you have slides as well. You have your, your clicker with you. Right. I can't turn lights down, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. It's... Uh a great pleasure to be here. Can you all hear me? In this day and age, there is most certainly something about Islam. Not because it's any worse than other religions. As I've said many times before, all religions are equal and equally bad. No religion looks favorably upon women, gays, free thinkers, apostates, heretics, blasphemers, people of other religions and atheists. And punishing free thinkers has always been a fundamental and long-standing feature of all major religions. But there is something about Islam, primarily because it's the banner of, a, of Islamism, a far-right political movement spearheading what I call an Islamic inquisition. Islamists want the far-right restructuring of societies. Concretely, this means a khalife or Islamic state, the implementation of Sharia law, the imposition of the Borga, compulsory veiling, gender segregation, defending hudud punishments like death by stoning, and the execution of apostates, just to name a few. You don't have to look far to see what Islamism is. It's the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Saudi government, Boko Haram, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hezbollah Tahrir, the Taliban, and of course the Islamic State, formerly known as ISIS, which has made tremendous advances in the past few days and months, and which continues to shock and outrage all humanity with its sheer terror and brutality. ISIS is Islamism without its palatable wrappings, often fed to people in Europe and the West, where its manifestations, like Sharia courts in Britain and the Law Society's guidance on Sharia wills, which institutionalizes Islamist values, are portrayed as people's right to religion, even by some humanist groups. Whilst there are differences in degree amongst Islamists, as there are in any phenomenon, fundamentally, they are all striving for the same things, including groups like the Islamic Education and Research Academy in the UK, which has charitable status, and which debates well-known scientists and atheists while defending the Khalifa and death to apostates. They're very kind though, they say. They prefer beheading as it's less painful. Possibly pain, uh, painless for them, it's, it's painless, they say. And also, they've been key in segregating British universities. Some keep telling us of such moderate or soft Islamists. In my opinion, there are none. Fascism is fascism, no matter how it is wrapped and dressed. There is also, in this context, no moderate Islam. Even if there are a million interpretations, today Islam is what ISIS tells you it is. It is what Khamenei in Iran tells you it is. 
It is what the Taliban says it is, by sheer terror and brute force. In many places, you must either submit to their Islam or die. When religion is in the state or has influence, it's no longer a question of personal belief, but of political power. Of course, when I talk about Islam, I'm not speaking of Islam as a personal belief. Or Muslims who are believers, like my father and mother, and maybe some of yours. People practice Islam and religion, as Keenan mentioned, in innumerable personal ways. They pick and choose the aspects that fit their lives, and more often than not, people's humanity shines through irrespective of their religions or beliefs. Being Muslim doesn't mean one is an Islamist any more than being Turkish means you support Erdogan, or being Nigerian means you support Boko Haram, or being British means you support the British National Party or the Christian right. <coughs> As Turkey and Amina in Tunisia. No group or community or society is homogeneous. As Keenan Malik says, secularism and fundamentalism are not ideas stitched into people's DNA. They are like all values, observed, absorbed, accepted, or rejected. In fact, Muslims, or those to perceived to be Muslims, are the first victims and at the forefront of battling Islamism. Karima Ben Mune highlights nearly 300 such people and groups in her book called Your Fatwa Does Not Apply Here. She records the resistance and refusal of so many people. Also, over the past decades, many have voted against Islamism with their feet by fleeing Islamic states and movements in unprecedented numbers. Right now, as we speak, thousands of Yazidis considered devil worshippers by ISIS languish in the mountains of Sinjar with children dying of thirst and nowhere to go surrounded by ISIS. <coughs> Islam today isn't a private matter, especially not during an inquisition. Islam is not just the opium of the masses, as Marx has said, it is their genocide heir. Of course, it's very good to be balanced and speak of all religions being equally problematic. Even after an enlightenment, has removed much of Christianity's power and influence, Christianity is nowhere a benign force. It creates misery wherever it can. But you cannot look at ISIS right here and now, and its beheadings, and its crucifixions, and sexual jihad, and speak of similar attitudes during Victorian times in England, or Europe's dark ages. ISIS represents our dark ages in the 21st century. It's good to be balanced, particularly when you have a far right using the issue of Sharia law and Islamism to attack immigrants and Muslims and absurdly demanding a ban on the Quran as if the Bible was banned to stop the Spanish Inquisition. A far right that feigns crocodile tears for those killed by Islamists, yet cheers the massacre of innocent civilians in Gaza by the Israeli state. It is important to be balanced, but one must also be fair. If we cannot see that there is something about Islam and Islamism, then we cannot respond as we must. And if we don't, who will? <clears throat> Defending free thought and expression is crucial in this fight. Defending blasphemy and apostasy cases are hugely important. Removing blasphemy laws from the legal system is key. Oh, sorry, I'm really bad at this. It's, oh, I think I have to press harder. Sorry. The Council of Ex-Muslims deals with hundreds of such cases each year, but it is not enough to defend free expression and thought within a limited human rights or legal context. We must see blasphemy and apostasy laws and a defense of free expression within the larger context of religion in general and Islam in particular vis-a-vis -vis the question of political power. 
God is sabotaging me. <laughs> <laughs> Islam in the state or with political power is the end of free thought and the end of free expression. It is the end of democratic politics. It is the end of women's rights and gay rights and the rights of minorities. It is the end of everything that is worthy of the 21st century. It is a return to the dark ages. A humanist Congress today can only begin and end united for Sinjar and united against ISIS. It must stand unequivocally against Islamism, Sharia law, and the Khalifa. This is not about people's right to religion. It is about stopping Islamism's right to kill and slaughter and oppress. A humanist Congress must stand for equality of people not religions and beliefs. For universal rights, and this is a photo of Amina from Egypt, Alia El Mahdi from Egypt, sorry, Amina from Tunisia and myself, where I cut the Allah out of the Islamic regime's flag and we had a protest in support of women's rights and universal rights. A humanist Congress must stand for secularism and the separation of religion from the state, not just for Europe, but for the world. This is not a clash of civilizations. It is a clash between the theocrats and fascists versus the rest of us, Muslim and non, atheist and non. As the late Marxist Mansur Hikmat said, in Islam, the individual has no rights or dignity. In Islam, the woman is a slave. In Islam, the child is on par with animals. Free thinking is still deserving of punishment. It's a sin deserving of punishment. Music is corrupt. Sex without permission or religious certification is the greatest of sins. This is the religion of death. In reality, all religions are such, but most religions have been restrained by free thinking and freedom-loving humanity over hundreds of years. This one was never restrained or controlled. Restraining it, controlling it, in this day and age, that is our task. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Well, our third panelist is Alam Shahar.